recruiting station. Today I'll be giving a short class on how to read your orders. I'm going to focus primarily on active duty orders as these are generally the most complex. However, many of the things I talk about also apply to reserve orders, including HPSB, TPU, and APMC assignments. So congrats. You've passed all the hurdles of the application process and you've been selected for active duty in your specialty. Now what? Once your security clearance, any pending waivers, and your appointment as an officer has been approved, you'll receive your orders assigning you to active duty. Typically, these are sent to your recruiter, but sometimes they may be emailed directly to you if they're short notice. Orders can be extremely confusing to read, but they contain all the instructions you need to successfully transition to active duty. And they're legally binding, so you want to adhere to the stipulations they contain. Today, we're going to demystify that process. Here we have a copy of redacted orders for an officer who was selected for an active duty training program. At the top will be the order number and date. You'll need this information when scheduling your move, but we'll go over that process more in a later class. The first thing you want to review on your orders is the admin info. The admin blocks will show you your name, current address, rank, social security number, and that you're assigned to the active component of the Army. They'll also contain the two letter abbreviation for the core of the medical department you're assigned to. For example, these show AN for Army Nurse Corps. You want to review all this admin information to make sure it's correct. If you see any mistakes, let your recruiter know. Next, we'll get into the actual instructions portion of the orders. This will tell you where to be and when. And remember, these are legally binding, so if you anticipate any issues meeting these requirements, you need to contact your recruiter immediately. The first highlighted line here shows your reporting location. This is the unit you need to physically report to on the date shown. Sometimes the abbreviations can be confusing, but you can generally decipher them. For example, this here shows Bravo Company 187th Student Battalion at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. The six digit code in the middle there is called the unit identification code and it's used by our HR system to identify the unit. It's not relevant to you. Below that is the date and time you need to report. If there's no time shown, that means you have until 11.59 p.m. on that date to report. Lastly in this section is the unit you're assigned to. In this case, the reporting unit and assigned unit are the same. However, some installations will have all personnel report to one unit to conduct all their orientation and in-processing tasks and then report to their unit of assignment to begin work once that process is complete. Once you have your assignment information, you'll be able to get a better idea of what to expect at your first unit. For example, if you're assigned to a hospital, your day-to-day -day may be similar to a civilian clinical experience. But if you're assigned to a field hospital, a medical battalion, or a brigade combat team, your day-to-day -day may involve more Army-specific tasks and unit-level training, although you'll still be able to exercise your specialty in maintaining a required clinical competency. You can often look up your unit on social media to learn more about what they do and connect with your future teammate. After the reporting information comes all the additional instructions. You need to read these in their entirety. Yours may be in a different order than shown here, but I'm gonna highlight some of the most important information you need to keep an eye out for. So first here we have the travel mode. This states travel is authorized by POV or personally owned vehicle. This means you may travel by car from your current residence to your assigned duty station. If your orders don't say this, you're only authorized to fly and will not be reimbursed for any ground transportation expenses. Next, it states that this officer's authorized movement of family and shipment of household goods to the permanent assignment location. This first part is important if you have dependent family members such as a spouse or children. Your orders must contain this statement and list your family members later on in the orders in order for you to be reimbursed for any travel costs for your family. The portion about shipment of household goods is what authorizes you to be reimbursed for the cost of moving. We'll cover different ways to move your household goods in a later class. Next, we have early reporting to PCS, or permanent change of station, is not authorized. This means that you may not show up prior to that reporting date to enter onto active duty. Sometimes this will state that early reporting is authorized and will specify a number of days. For example, 30 days early reporting is authorized. If your orders say that, it means you have a window of 30 days leading up to the report date in which you can show up. Later on, your orders may discuss airline tickets and state that reimbursement is limited to the government contract rate. This means that if you do choose to fly, you're required to book your flight through the government travel office or you won't be reimbursed. Your recruiter can help you with this if you plan to fly. Next, we have information on housing. If this statement is included, you need to contact the housing services office at your new duty station to find out if there are any housing limitations or stipulations. For example, in some overseas locations or for some training programs, 
you might be required to live on post. It could also be less expensive for you to live on post or there may be additional cost of living factors you need to take into account before you enter into a lease. The housing office can provide you all the guidance on this. Next, somewhere in your orders, it'll state your service obligation, the length of your active duty contract. Here, it's 60 months for this training program. And as it states here, this begins upon entry onto active duty. Other service obligations may start upon completion of the training program, but the details will all be outlined in your orders. After that, we have information about your rank and any constructive credit that Congress approved you for. If you have any questions about your constructive credit, speak to your recruiter. If, for example, your board date was delayed several months and you were working in your field that entire time, you may be able to get additional credit for that time. Headquarters generally won't make adjustments just for a few days, but if we're talking something more like six months or a year of missed credit uh, that will significantly affect your rank and your promotion timeline, they'll consider updating your constructive credit. Next, we have that listing of every family member whose travel is authorized along with their date of birth and their relationship to you. You need to review this information to make sure it's complete and correct. Next, we have some more admin info, including your home record. This is the location you indicated during your application as the location you lived prior to coming on active duty. This is important because you can opt to remain a legal resident of this state the entire time you're on active duty, which often has pretty significant tax implications. It's also the location that the Army will use to calculate reimbursement for your final move when you eventually return to civilian life after you complete your tour, whether it's three years or 30. Your orders will also show your DORAs, which is the date you signed a reserve oath, if applicable, and your PEBD, or pay entry base date. This is the date used to calculate your time in service for pay purposes. So for example, if you have no prior military service, every two year anniversary of this date, you'll be moved into the next higher pay bracket. If you do have prior service, this date will be adjusted to account for that prior service. So that wraps up the main portion of the orders. However, many of you will have an additional attachment providing additional information for the Direct Commission course, or DCC, and Basic Officer Leader course, or BOLIC. This attachment provides all the information for those courses, including report dates, locations, and links to access frequently asked questions and supplemental info. One thing to pay attention to is whether you're listed as TDY in return, TDY en route, or TDY home station for these courses, as these will affect your travel planning, reimbursement, and household goods movement. TDY home station means the training is at the duty station you're assigned to, so no travel is required. The others mean that you'll be traveling and it'll be either en route uh, to your permanent duty station, or you'll be returning to your permanent duty station once the travel is complete. The rest of these instructions contain a lot of really helpful information and resources, so read them thoroughly. I've highlighted here some that may be the most relevant, including contact information if you have questions about your orders, information on shipping your household goods, obtaining more information about your duty station, and some helpful resources if your spouse is seeking employment in your next location. So that's how you read your orders. Remember, if you have any questions, be sure to reach out to your recruiter, station commander, or OIC. They're your primary points of contact up until you report to your duty station and your unit leadership is available to assist.